Hi, everyone. Welcome to our seventh 2023 Giller Book Club. My name is Daphna Rabinovich, and I will be your host for this evening. Please make sure to have your Zoom on a side by side for the best possible experience. And it is my profound pleasure tonight to introduce you to our interviewer, Omar El Akid. Omar is an author and a journalist. His debut novel, American War, was an international bestseller and has been translated into 13 languages. It won the Pacific Northwest Booksellers Association Award, the Oregon Book Award for Fiction, and the Kobo Emerging Writers Prize. His novel, What Strange Paradise, won the 2021 Scotiabank Giller Prize. He lives with his family in Portland, Oregon. And tonight, Omar will be interviewing Dimitri Nazrallah, author of the 2022 long-listed and exceptional novel, Hotline. Please feel free to submit your questions using the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen and join me in welcoming Omar and Dimitri. Hello. Hello. How is everybody doing? Um, Dimitri, first of all, thank you so much for, for doing this, for letting me be a part of it. Um, I really appreciate it. Oh, we have, we have uh, we've done a panel before, and you agreed to do a second one with me, So, um, which doesn't often happen. It bodes uh, well. So, yeah, all right. Um, I'll see if I can screw it up this time. Um, I, should, I should formally introduce uh, Dimitri. Um, he's written four novels. He uh, was born in Lebanon. He lived in Kuwait, Greece, Dubai. Um, I love reading this. It makes me feel less alone. Um, I, had, I had a similar, a similar run. Um, you've been nominated for Canada Reads, uh, Dublin Literary Award, which used to be, it was a Dublin Impact, and I think they-, they Way back when, it. when I got nominated, was still an Impact. Right, yeah. right. Um, I don't know, you, you, you edit, you're the fiction editor at Be Cool. Um, mostly, here's, here's how I want to introduce Dimitri. I was fortunate enough to, um, to curate the Vancouver Writers Festival. And that means that I get to be a bit of a kid in a candy store uh, and just hand a list of names over to the people who actually have to do the real work uh, of getting people there. And you were the first name on the list. Uh, you were up there with some of my favorites that I had known about for a long time um, because of Hotline, because that book um, just blew me away. And it made me feel a lot less lonely um, about experiences I had when I came here, which is interesting for a book that seems to me in so many ways about loneliness. I'm going to stop rambling and I'm going to start by asking you to give us give us the the sales pitch for the book uh, instead of me sort of uh, wrecking it with my attempt to explain it. Just sure. give me give me what this book is about. Well, uh, Hotline was, as I, I say this in the back of the book too, it's loosely inspired by uh, my family's own arrival in Canada, specifically my mother's story. Uh, in previous novels, I'd really focused on my father and my relationship with him. And uh, coming to this fourth novel, I'd realized I, I hadn't uh, looked at that part of my family story much. And uh, we arrived here in the, the mid to late 80s and uh, it showed up in a Montreal much like the one reflected in the book. My mother uh, was a French teacher. Uh, by profession. Uh, we were accepted for immigration uh, on the premise uh, that uh, that would be advantageous to her uh, once we arrived in Quebec specifically. And when we got here, no one would give her a job. So after months of trying to get past the, the cursory supply teachers list, uh, which she never managed to, uh, we, uh, she, she took a job uh, at a place called Nutrisystem, which was a pretty trendy diet uh, plan uh, center uh, at the time. And what they would do is they had these uh, food boxes, uh, these yellow food boxes that uh, they uh, would help, uh, that would help people count their calories. They would take the guesswork out of it. So one of my first experiences in Canada, uh, apart from watching a lot of TV, uh, was these but with these food boxes showing up and eventually finding their way into my lunchbox and uh, so uh, music plus which is uh, the French equivalent of, of much music and uh, and uh, these food boxes uh, were my uh, experience of my first year 
in Canada. And uh, so I, I wanted to revisit that time and, uh, and work with those boxes and I built a story from there. I, I wanted to ask you a little bit about um, closeness, I suppose. Um, when the source material is that close to you, what are the challenges of, because you're not writing, this isn't a memoir, you know, you don't have the constraints of nonfiction there. You have a separate set of constraints where you could veer into certain places, but the source of so much of this material is this person who's inc incredibly close to you. How do you think about that as a writer and what are the sort of, what kind of tight ropes are you walking when you're in that kind of situation? Well, I think I had to wait till I was in my mid forties before I could even broach this subject matter because it was too close for the longest time. And I had a, uh, a very, I guess, intergenerational relationship with, uh, with my mother specifically in that I, uh, I saw her from the child's vantage point for the longest time. And it took becoming a parent myself uh, in order for me to be able to, to turn the, chair, the tables on that. Uh, situation and begin to see what it would have been like to not be uh, the child in that situation, to be arriving in a new country and not only to have to acclimatize yourself to this new culture, but to survive and to make sure that you're, the people you're caring for uh, also manage to survive uh, relatively unscathed. So being becoming a father myself and uh, i began writing this book roughly at around the same time that uh, at the same age that uh, my son uh was uh, when i first arrived in canada so around uh, the 10 11 uh 12 mark um uh, i began to see this from like that different vantage point and it gave me the distance i needed to infuse some of my some of my own thought process into the situation, I was lucky enough to be well, a lot further ahead uh, than than my parents were uh, at that stage. Uh, but I could I could still uh, remember enough of those times to be able to to to, to empathize with uh, where we were and and what that meant. I'd always looked at that period as the the year I got jilted uh, in a way. <laughs> Uh, everything changed on me. It was uh, I, uh, I had a number of realizations moving here uh, involving schooling, involving my place in the family that, that all happened at once. And they kind of led to this jaded personality for the teenage years to follow. So that colored my relationship for the longest time. And it took until my 40s to be able to like uh, step back from that and be able to uh, really just uh, see uh, what my mother must have been going through. There's certain parts of the narrative that I, I, I certainly don't want to spoil, but I'm, I'm just curious, when you're sitting down to, to write, do you have the chronology of the book? Do you have the, the narrative thread in mind, or are you sort of discovering the narrative turns as you, as you piece it together? I'm very much someone who discovers the narrative as it, as it comes along. I sit down, I put the blinders on, and I aim for my 500 to 1,000 words per day, and uh, I see what comes out. And... Uh, uh, what happened with this book is that I overshot the ending by uh, about 50 or 60 pages the first time round. And so usually when I'm working on something the first time, I, I, I get a sense that the story's over once I'm sitting at the computer and just finding myself writing redundant things. So I let it just sit for a while. And when I came back to it, I found that I'd already you know, had the natural ending in there uh, already and then came back to it. So it's a pretty much a process of, uh, of feeling out uh, the story, seeing what would work. I think uh, it's nice to begin with a few authenticating circumstances that I, I you know, that we had arrived uh, to Montreal in the 80s, that my mother worked at this uh, weight loss center, that I was a particular age and that we lived in a particular apartment and neighborhood. So I was working with those set uh, features because they were the authenticating uh, aspects of the story for me. And the rest, I was free to kind of just see what would uh, arrive into my imagination at the time and, and really just go from there. This feels like a pretty good time to get a, to get a reading, uh, if you don't mind. Yeah, we'll just start at the beginning of uh, the story. Uh, and we begin with the, the book with uh, Muna, the protagonist, uh, looking uh, for work. Uh, I used to be a business major. I tend to have economics on my brain, uh, first and foremost, when I'm thinking of these situations. So her looking for work 
uh, was definitely uh, something I wanted to, to spend time on. So uh, here she is uh, at the beginning, uh, showing up to a job interview. Pardon my masculine voice for this otherwise feminine protagonist. Uh, at five minutes to two, I check my face in the mirrored walls of the building's lobby, straighten my blazer, touch up my lipstick, and then board the elevator to the sixth floor. I've been through this process many times now. I'm always hopeful that this time will turn out differently. Inshallah. I'm already finding things to like about this building. The lobby is bright and well kept. There's a security desk to keep all the Abu Rihas from doing drugs in the public washrooms. Even a good, uh, even the elevator is a good size. I know myself. I grow attached to little touches like this too fast. And I begin to imagine myself anywhere and everywhere in an effort to will the world to bend my way for once. I'm a dreamer. My mother always said so. The elevator doors open to the sixth floor where a promising white lobby and relatively clean carpeting greet me. Someone has thought to clean out the large ashtray uh, garbage can by the elevator, so it's not the first smell to backhand you when the doors slide open. Along the wall to the right is one of the mo those modern looking glass doors and stenciled across it in neon red letters is the name Nutrifor. I step inside and announce myself to the board receptionist. Mona Haddad, I say, here for the information session. We spoke earlier. She rolls her eyes, checks her list, and then points to a room down the hall. Follow the signs for information session and wait with the others. Help yourself to the free coffee. I hope she doesn't notice my eyebrows perk up at the mention of free coffee. I find that impressive. At the end of the hall, I step into a conference room with windows facing over the north end of the city. There is a long, wide table with a screen on one end and a dozen other people seated around it waiting for the session to start. I drift toward the coffee station and mechanically fill a paper cup and find a seat along the windowed side of the room. From up here, you can see the McGill University campus and the mansions along, along Dr. Penfield and Depay, and then Mount Royal. As I wait for the meeting to begin, I try to find my home. There it is, the tall apartment building just outside the campus gates along University Street, the only place that would rent a furnished apartment to a single mother, an immigrant with no references. I'll stop there. Every time I do one of these events with a writer I admire, I have to sort of control myself from letting the whole thing just veer into craft territory, where I keep asking you about how you how you put these sentences together. Um, but I'm not going to not do that as well. So I'm wondering what you are, what you're like as a writer on the sentence level. Are you sort of a basher or a swooper? Are you are you editing at the line level as you go along? Are you leaving time in between passages and going back to them? How are you just purely on a sort of keystroke level? I think with this book, the mechanics all came down to the voice. And uh, I'd, uh, after I finished my third novel, The Bleeds, I spent the summer uh, really just sketching out a number of different stories. Every day I'd sit down and see what, what I could write and see what like felt good. And about four or five stories in, I got to this character. And uh, she had a life to her all of a sudden. I felt like if I wrote in this voice, I knew these people. It wasn't only my mother. It was, you know, this community of women who were around in the 80s and 90s when we'd moved to Montreal. Uh, and it was their personalities, their can-do nature, uh, their pragmatism, uh, and their cadences and idiosyncrasies in the way they spoke. So I figured... I'd grown up with that logic system and uh, the, the set of priorities that come along with that logic. Uh, and I could work with that. And all of a sudden, it just like leapt off the page. So I was trying to capture that, uh, that, that uh, sense of speech uh, most times, but also have it meet halfway with how I naturally write. Uh, so I could work with, with both ends. And so for the first time, I found myself incorporating Arabic words into uh, into my work, which I hadn't done before. 
but it felt like I could not not do it in this case because it was a first person and it was a certain type of character, which led me to these interesting debates about how we switch codes a lot when we're in society. We'll talk one way to one set of people and then we were with another set of people and we take on a different persona. So Montreal, that happens with French and English pretty regularly, but then there's all the allophones, uh, newly arrived people who, who tend to use their own cultures as well. Uh, to add like a third uh, rung to, uh, to this uh, to this situation. So uh, all these different dynamics came up and it, it, it felt like rich territory to explore. I, I was reading an interview of yours where you, you had said something I found really fascinating. You were talking about Arabic and you were talking about how it's a very individualized language, which I'd never thought of before, but struck me as as being a really interesting way to, to um, think about that. I mean, I just I just wrote a, a story for um, this magazine was doing an all Qatar themed issue. And so I lived in Qatar. They asked me to write a short story and I had I had filled it with not even slang, not even Qatari slang, but the slang that the foreign Arabs would use. In, and so the the range of people who are going to get these references is is tiny. And I was thinking on that spectrum of of you know, from at one end explaining every single Arabic word and putting it in italics and making sure it's safe for the kind of reader who'd have no no experience with it, all the way to the other end of not doing that. I feel like you're closer to over here. And I'm wondering what what kept you from going to that place previously and and, and sort of what what it does for you to to be able to not just use this language, but to use it in that way. Well, I mean, I think I found myself coming up against these situations where I, I know from experience that outside of Lebanese Arabic, I have a hard time understanding. Like, take me a, if you drop me in Egypt, I'll pick up a few words here and there, uh, put me all the way in Morocco. They'll understand me, but I won't understand anything back. Just the, the dialect is completely different and uh, the form of expression, apart from a few like semi religious terms, and which tend to like gravitate all across the Middle East uh the 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 impressions are all different uh on the language so uh, and then beyond that i found myself in a situation where you have to write these out phonetically in english so you want them to be able to be easily pronounceable uh which a lot of arabic isn't to people who don't speak arabic i mean we use a part of the throat all the way back here that uh, a lot of people have trouble accessing if, if they're not used to, to that language i mean and good luck reflecting that on the page as a, as a you know as a means to pronunciation so i had to simplify uh what i used to to be something that would uh, be easily read uh by people who were non-arabic speakers because I didn't want to end up in a situation where I had to include a glo glossary, which is something that's come up a, a lot since this book has found a much wider readership. Why is there not a glossary uh, for this language? Why is uh, why do I have to look it up myself? And the answer to that is because I want you to just fall into the voice. And this is all idiomatic language that if you pick up, if you, if you hear it repeated a number of times, you pick up the context of it quite quickly. And so you kind of learn it that way. And that's just how people learn languages in general when they get immersed in situations. So I wanted the process to, to feel uh, like you were learning it yourself. I don't know yeah, if I absolutely. answered your question there, but I kind of view no, it. I, yeah. All my questions are so half formed that you can really say whatever <laughs> you want. I just ramble for a while um, and tell you how much you, I loved your book. Uh, and then you can feel free to take it whatever direction you want. I mean, yeah, like even, you know, I have this issue with, with my name, right? So my name's not Omar, it's Omar, but Dain uh, is is sort of uh, unpronounceable in English. And I was lamenting this to a friend of mine, uh, an Arab friend. And finally she said, oh, why don't you just type it out with the three? Because there is, unbeknownst to most people, their Arabs have a sort of, it, it originates from texting, I think. Yeah, or like we use that three a lot. The three and the seven for a ha and all of this stuff. And then that, that feels like glossary territory for me. Once, yeah, because no one else really knows what that is. It's a part of that code, right? That's regional. Yeah, nobody has a, any idea. I mean, it's it's um, it's interesting to me as, as a very small subset of, of a larger issue, which is this notion that about 100 years ago, a bunch of British and French folks drew some lines on a map, and we have Lebanon as mm -hmm. a result, or we have these places where, by law, the prime minister has to be Christian and the president has to be Muslim and the, to satisfy everybody. And I'm wondering how much the the sort of the the 
the starting conditions of what to many people today would be would be you know the source of their nationalism i am lebanese i am you know like when you look back at the starting conditions of how the middle east middle east came to be what it is geograph or in terms of nation state how much does that affect both what you write about and what you're thinking about once once you get on the page well i mean that's a that's a complicated question i'm <laughs> sure you you know because i mean it it's um it's a lot easier to say I am Lebanese and feel nationalistic pride in that from the outside. Once you get inside a place like Lebanon, it's all factioned off. Uh, and uh, you belong to a group within a group uh, at, at best. Uh, and so, you know, you go to certain neighborhoods, you go to certain regions, but you don't go to others because that's the way the population is divided and there's a history of conflict between different regions. So. Do I want to bring all of that in uh, to a book? It would, uh, I think, it would, it would take a uh, take the story in a completely different direction. So, I'm very careful about what I do bring in because I know I'm bringing it into a Canadian culture more than anything else, and it has to really be accepted here. So, the aspect I wanted to bring in was into this book in particular it had less to do with politics and more to do with this this notion of a mask society that I've always noticed uh, and felt kind of like burdened down by. And I know a lot of other Lebanese people and maybe Arab people beyond that uh, also feel weighed down by this, this idea that you can't really say what you want to say. You have to say what the situation calls for uh, in a certain dynamic. And so like when you have people over at your house, you present them in a certain room, you off, you, you, the, the visit goes according to a script that everyone knows that no one will ever, uh, you know, uh, you know, recognize. Um, and everything is played out almost theatrically. Uh, everyone has a role to play. Uh, and that goes from family visits to larger like uh, social dynamics in, in different situations to the point where everyone knows what their role is, but very few people are actually looking at who they are uh, within that. And so I kind of wanted, that's why I wanted to explore interiority. And that's why I made uh, Muna almost feel relieved to have left behind uh, that dynamic. One of the things that she does uh, enjoy about uh, Canadian life is this idea that she doesn't have to act anymore uh, to conform to this, uh, this very rigid societal structure uh, that everyone knows, but no one acknowledges. When you're when you're putting this together, and so much of it is autobiograph uh, autobiographical or or semi biographical, in terms of of the source material, how big is the negative space of that? Are you thinking? Are there certain elements that were it someone else's life, or were it a little more distant from your life, you maybe would have incorporated into the into the narrative. But in this case, you said, no, this is too close, or this is something that I don't want to put in what is ultimately going to be a thing that goes out into the world and is read by so many people. Yeah, I mean, I think what, what I wanted to do with this book is not dress it up in any epicness. I, I'd done that in previous books before, and it felt like the political act with this book, and for me, it's very much a political story, is that you can't look away into the imaginary uh, at any point. I mean, the character does in places, but it's very much uh, locked in to this uh, story of trying to find work and living in this small apartment and the, the, the nitty gritty of survival, uh, basically, uh, because it, it, it felt to me like, that was still a very invisible part of uh, the Canadian story in that we, we tend to really congratulate the success stories that emerge from that later on. And people will say, well, my family arrived here 20 years ago with nothing and I became this huge thing and uh, look what this country has done for me. And, and that's a great story to have. Uh, but that first year is a pretty particular episode in a lot of people's lives when they arrive here. It's much different than the other years. And it seemed to, especially living here in Quebec, reflect a lot of the same issues that existed in the 80s that were still pretty much pervasive now. And so I felt like I could write this semi-historical novel 
and have it speak directly to this moment. And that's great when your life gives you circumstances like that to work with, to say like, you know, this applies now. Let's see what will happen if I put this out there. I'm wondering how much of that first year still hangs on, on you now in terms of how you think about Quebec. Obviously it affects your writing, but just sort of, you've had this immense success, you're established in this country. Um, how much of, of that first year is, is still there for you? I mean, I think it's still there. I think there's certain in things you don't forget. Um, like I never forget being unemployed. It, it didn't happen for long, but when that happens, uh, it's something that, that stays with you for a very long time. It creates a trauma. I, I'll never forget being poor. I've had episodes along the way where we've had poverty and it, it becomes a mentality uh, after a while that no matter how much money you make afterwards or how comfortable you become, you're still a little uncomfortable because you're like, it could all go away. It all has at some point before. Um, I'll never forget what it's like to have nothing more than two suitcases and start over. Uh, so I think we don't think enough of these migrations as residual traumas that remain in people's lives that affect the decisions you make moving forward that affect your sense of self even if you do become established and settled i mean that notion of uh, reflecting back on that narrative in a particular way is in itself a, a reaction to trauma and uh, i especially began to notice it when it was my turn to raise somebody and uh, I really began to think, well, am I going to take a different turn here? And, or like, where does this particular chip on my shoulder come from? Why do I still have a chip on my shoulder? Where, you know, am I passing that chip along? And, you know, I'm quite the believer in intergenerational traumas and these things being passed down that uh, uh, I inherited uh, things from uh, my parents that I will probably never know the real details of. They inherited things from their parents that are completely like secret to me and so on, right? And all this gets passed along. So I think there's something in that first year that, that stays forever, even though it tends to have this half-life that regenerates in a strange way, in an unexpected way along the way. And it could be dormant for very long, but I go back to, uh, I mean, the example of when we were locked down in the pandemic just a few years ago. I, uh, one of the first things I thought of when uh, I couldn't leave my house was not of the virus traveling outside, but of those first five years of my life in the Civil War in Lebanon when I never left the apartment. Because when there's a Civil War outside and you're a kid, you're not going outside. Uh, so... That, that feeling of enclosure jumped over almost four decades and to come back and haunt me again, even though I hadn't thought about it for a really long stretch. And then that other time when that happened again was in the, that little apartment in Montreal when we first arrived, when there was four of us living in that one bedroom uh, apartment that I described in the book. Um, and so the, all these enclosed spaces have a way of kind of just like occupying you. I'm sure you've been asked this question a million times, but I have to ask, what's, what's been the family's reaction to, to the book? What, what responses have you gotten from the people closest to you? Oh, it's a, I mean, it's, I think I showed this book to my mom before it was being published. I was like, I wrote about uh, you. You might uh, want to read this before this, this goes out. And uh, she was a little apprehensive uh at first but then she read it and she said you know what this is the first book of yours that i've read where you don't seem angry anymore and uh you know there's like a newfound maturity i think i mean because my relationship with my mother was not like the one described in the book uh, i think it was uh at the time a lot more antagonistic given where we were in the stages of our, of our lives and that uh, that kind of held on for a very long time that's one of those traumas of that first year that i was referring to we got set into these molds of uh i'm in one corner and you're in another and we kind of went from there for the next like 25 to 30 years uh and things only really began to like simmer down once uh, she became a grandmother and i became a father and there was someone else next in line and uh so I found myself 
in this situation where it uh, maybe I had mellowed along the way. Maybe I, I was seeing things a little differently. And, and now we kind of just, uh, we laugh about it. Now that uh, this book has become so widely read, she's, uh, she's, she kind of chuckles at how people conflate the story in a way to become our lives sometimes as people will want to do and uh, turn it completely into memoir, which, which it isn't. But uh, I think uh, for her, it, uh, it, it's, uh, it makes the, the six months that she spent at Nutri System at least feel like it resulted in something. Sorry, the, the first year, yeah, my first year, and we moved to Montreal from, from the Middle East. And my first year there, I was so angry at my parents and I couldn't get a job for a while. And then finally I, I got one and it was at a call center for what was obviously a fraud, um, this, this marketing magazine thing. And uh, I only knew one person in town, a Lebanese guy who has the same last name as the main character in your, in your not. This book messed with my head when I first picked it up. It, <laughs> your it was, first name is there. Your, your yeah, it's not great. Name. It's not great. There's an Omar in there. Um, so I was fortunate enough to uh, announce the, the Giller long list uh, last year. And um, about, <laughs> about 12 hours before that happened, I separated my shoulder at the climbing gym and tore a bunch of ligaments. Long story short, I was on a ton of painkillers when, when I was reading out the list. So I have very little recollection of what the hell happened during that period. I wanted to know what your Giller experience has been like being long listed and then moving on to, to the Canada Reads as well. This book has gotten a ton of attention, all very well deserved. What has the process of going from, from publication to getting these this sort of big spotlights cast on the book? What, is, what has that been like for you? Oh, I mean, this is my fourth novel. And when the Giller announcement came, it was around like 10 o'clock in the morning, if I'm not mistaken. And I had a class to teach at 10.15. So I was in my office at Concordia, just watching the announcement really quickly before. Uh, usually sometimes they give you a heads up that something's going to happen. It wasn't the case this year. So I was half under the impression that I'm just watching it for trivia purposes more than anything else. Uh, and then uh, my name got called out. And I think I, I turned it off shortly after that because I had to get to class. I was walking down the hall in a daze and I, I just kind of blurted it out to the first other professor I saw. Uh, and then like stumbled into the bathroom and then like uh, found my way to class. And uh, it was, I guess it was a kind of validation because this is my fourth book. So I've kind of, it's been about 20 years that I've been working on this. And you, when you publish that first and second book, you're really hoping for that kind of attention to happen. And you're hoping it will galvanize your career and, and really catapult things. Now that didn't happen for me until the fourth one. And so, after especially the second one, which was a book that kind of broke me professionally uh, and made me think that I really need to change my sense of expectations in terms of how I'm looking at this industry if I'm going to like continue writing. I need to think about my reasons for writing. Um, I, I, I really began to just be comfortable in my lane and be like, Montreal, uh, if, if I'm not going to be able to have a national presence, then I'm gonna have a pretty strong presence in Montreal. And I'm going to like work with this community and take that kind of like punk rock attitude and just build it from the ground up uh, myself and do something here that, that's quite exciting. And luckily I was able to work with Vehicle cool and Simon Dardic uh, to be able to get something like that underway. So I felt like I had a pretty good audience in my lane, a literary audience of the people who were just, you know, who were around for every book and who were a very stable uh, group of people that I could, uh, I could rely on to, to build things up. And then this all began to happen. So it feels like a really nice gift because I'm, I'm happy where I am. I'm not going to change anything about what I'm doing uh, or how I go about it. And so I get to enjoy this moment without feeling like my whole literary personality has to be up for grabs uh, and I have to transform. So uh, I just, I, uh, I'm comfortable in my own skin, I guess, is the answer to that. Sounds nice. I like that. I'm, look, <laughs> I'm looking forward to that day where I can say I'm comfortable in my own skin. Um, we've just passed the half hour mark, so I'll remind people, uh, if you all got Q&A's uh, cues, put them in the Q&A, and we will um, get to them at around the 45 minute mark. Um, there's already some really good ones, uh, good ones there, but please feel free to keep posting. Um, 
I, when I first learned about the number of things that you do, uh, my petty jealousness kicked in. I don't like people who are good at more than one thing. Uh, it feels like showing off. Uh, you teach, you translate, you're a journalist. I wanted to ask you about how you managed to do all of this and not keep the walls from falling down. And I particularly wanted to know what translation does for you, just in terms of your overall literary endeavors. Well, I'm glad it looks impressive from the from the outside. I think from the inside, it's uh, it's what uh, people do in Montreal, or they did it at a, at a particular generation in the early 2000s when there was not much going on here. So there weren't really any jobs. Uh, if you were going to make a living here, it was at that point quite cheap to live. So you could you could really just piece together a bunch of things and and kind of get by that way. So. I, I really just began working in communications and then like drifted from there into translating for cultural organizations because uh, every French organization needs uh, someone uh, English speaking on board who can, uh, you know, make their documents bilingual. So that's where I began with a translation. And then I got back into teaching at Concordia. So one thing just built up to the next and I never really settled into a full-time thing. Writing was never something that I could afford to do full-time, so I kind of had to just keep the whole carousel uh, underway. I'm fortunate enough now that I can teach for seven months of the year and have five months to myself for writing, so that's kind of balanced out at this point, and uh, but yeah, other things have come along. I think the translation, uh, the literary translation, came along at a time when it seemed like an opportunity to uh, to make some money from writing. And I think most people who get into it uh, will will say, will admit that it is probably the most lucrative part of uh, the entire writing process. Uh, translators get paid uh, really quite well uh, compared to actual novelists um, who really just have to wait for royalties uh, if that happens. Um, so, uh, I kind of just picked things up uh, piecemeal and just never let things go uh, along the way. And it just uh, became this form of uh, keeping myself busy and also staying connected to a larger community. I'll leave it at that for now. <laughs> I, uh, a couple more and then, and then we'll switch to the, to the audience Q&A, but I wanted to ask you a little bit about the editing process for this novel. I believe it was Bethany who, our, our mutual friend who, who, who did some of the editing on this and, and Liz Johnson. I, oh, sorry, sorry, Liz Johnson, not Bethany. Um, and Liz, I, I got a chance to work with her uh, a couple of weeks ago as an incredible editor. I'm wondering if there was any uh, trepidation on on your part going into it, a uh, book that has this specific an experience at, at the heart of it, uh, whether you were worried about how the editing process would go and how how did the editing process go? Oh, it went well. I'm actually the easiest person in the world to edit. I'll accept 99% of all edits. I'm like a, a dog lying on their back, putting their stomach up for people to rub. I'm that uh, agreeable uh, as, uh, as a writer waiting to be edited. I think part of the situation is that because I'm an editor myself at VQ and I've been doing that for about a decade now, I'm working on other people's manuscripts all the time. So I've, I've kind of honed this process of what a book needs uh, over the years. Most writers will, you know, go through one book every four or five years. I go through four books a year on top of my own work. So the mechanics of it have really become quite uh, fluid and solidified in, actually that's contrasting in a way, uh, but they've become quite sharpened, let's say, uh, in, uh, in, in, my, in my thought process. Um, so manuscripts tend to arrive more fully developed uh, than, uh, than in other cases. And I tend to know how to revise them quite well. We needed Liz in the process. And Simon and I discussed uh, bringing someone in because, uh, I, I couldn't go to, to press without an outside eye, uh, first of all. And secondly, because I felt comfortable enough in the Lebanese elements of the story, but this is a story in a woman's voice. And there was no way I was gonna have it go to print without having a, a female editor uh, come on board uh, and at least uh, vet that part. Uh, of the story and uh, and finesse it uh, where it, it needed to be finessed. So we we very much felt that we needed 
uh, that kind of voice uh, on the project. And uh, Simon had worked with Liz before. I'd never worked with Liz before that, but uh, when Liz came in and uh, really offered some very uh, good uh, suggestions, uh, the, the the first chapter of the book was lopped off and redistributed later on in the process, so it started at a much better point. Uh, we had uh, some uh, some very long discussions about how the Arabic would be treated and how it would be balanced between. Uh, Arabic speakers and those who don't speak Arabic and how much of it needs to be on the page. There was there used to be a lot more Arabic in this book. And I think two to three people who read it along the way said, you know, you really have to cut some of this out because you're not the only reader here. Uh, someone else is maybe going to want to read this book. And we, uh, and we have to take into account uh, that, uh, that, that persona. So there was this uh, really trying to figure out where the balance was, what the right balance was in terms of how much Arabic to use and, and how to treat that Arabic, to not italicize it, to decolonize the editing process, something we hear about a lot. But this seemed like an opportunity to really put that to work and uh, to make the languages feel equal across the board between the French, the Arabic, uh, and the English, and, and to let people just kind of figure it out, to, to, to throw them in the deep end of the pool and say, you know, you're, you're big enough to kind of figure out what's going on here. Uh, the book's not going to pander uh, this to you. We're, we're going to, you know, we, we shouldn't be afraid of other languages. So Liz was very good at all those features and, and was really an immense uh, contributor to this process. She, um, she finished editing uh, a, a nonfiction piece that I wrote for Brick. And um, most of the comments that I, you know, how they send you to you with the comments in the word file. And most of my comments were just like, yes, I'm sorry. So like every every edit that she made, it's a much better piece on the other side of that. Um, usually I do this anyway with my interviews where I, I ask I ask whoever I'm interviewing for some recommendations. I think it's a small tradition with this book club. So I will uh, leave you uh, to give us a couple of of uh, some some recommendations before we go to the the audience Q and A. What are you What are you reading right now? What's sort of uh, blown you well, away? Well, as I was thinking about this, I mean, I'm I'm pretty invested in the Montreal uh, community here. And so I, I do, a, I work with a lot of writers uh, and I, I'm uh, very invested in the next generation of writers coming up. So I thought I'd lean my picks towards people I'm working with, or I have recently worked with and others outside that circle who, who I think quite highly of. Uh, the first book I'm uh, presenting is Prophetess by Baharan Bani Ahmadi. Uh, this book came out uh, last year. It's a, an Esplanade uh, title. So I worked with Baharan on, uh, on this, uh, this book. Uh, it came out maybe three months after a hotline and uh, managed to win the, the Quebec Writers Federation Hugh McLennan Prize for Fiction, which it was a giant upset at the time. It, it uh, surprised everyone by beating out Rawi Haj and Neil Smith, uh, who were also nominated for the prize. So that got the book a fair bit of attention. Baharan is uh, uh, Iranian. Uh, by origin. She moved here in 2018. She was originally an actress, but could no longer do that in Iran. And so uh, came to Canada and tried to rebuild her, her uh, creative career here. This was her first book in English, which is her third language. So there was a process of really uh, building uh, this up. One of the most surreal, unique books you'll ever read. It's largely about a, a, uh, a girl named Sarah who sees her older sister uh, murdered and what happens in society after that. But it goes into some very strange places. And I compare it to Kafka a lot. It just takes some very sharp left turns that you wouldn't expect. An imagination unlike uh, any other. So I'd recommend uh, Prophetess for sure. The second title is one we have coming out with Esplanade uh, just uh, in the next couple of weeks. It's probably in some bookstores already. This is Dandelion Daughter by Gabrielle Bouillon Tremblay. Uh, it uh, was originally published as La Fille del Mem uh, in, uh, in 2021 in, here in Quebec. And uh, Eli Tarek El Bashlani Lynch has done the translation. It is the uh, story of uh, a coming of age trans identity story uh, set in the Charlevoix region of Quebec, which is about five hours north of uh, Montreal, very uh, rural area with uh, uh, all the accompanying uh, rural attitudes that come along uh, with uh, that space. So it's about uh, 
discovering your transgendered identity uh, in such a space and coming to terms with it and also finding your own people. Uh, a very heartwarming story, the kind of story that uh, brings a lot of people uh, to tears. In it's it's sold almost 20,000 copies here in Quebec alone already, and uh, has really sparked a conversation about uh, social acceptance uh, in mainstream uh, society that uh, wasn't there before this book. So it is a really significant book in uh, on the Quebec scene, and now it's coming out in English. I guess that takes us next to. Uh, Eli's own book, Eli, Beshla, uh, Eli uh, Tarek uh, Beshlani Lynch's uh, The Good Arabs, uh, which came out, I think, two years ago at this point, um, published by Metonymy Press here, which is very exciting, uh, younger Montreal uh, publishing house, um, uh, which Eli, uh, who Eli is associated with as well. This book won the Grand Prix du Livre de Montréal. It was only the second uh, book in that prize's history to uh, to be. It's only the second time an English language book took that prize uh, in the in the prize's history. So Eli is really a uh, a, a very exciting new voice. A lot of great things are going to come uh, from uh, from their uh, world uh, that people should look for. The Good Arabs is a good place. Uh, to start there. It's a, it's a fusion between uh, fiction, poetry, uh, this, the multimedia approach that uh, is, is quite uh, popular here in Montreal. Another writer who's working in that direction is David Bradford, um, who was nominated for the Griffin Prize in the last year that they had a uh, Canadian category. This is Dream of uh, No One But Myself, uh, a, a hybrid work of poetry and fiction, uh, very autobiographical in nature. David Bradford is probably one of the most intelligent minds I've, uh, I've come across uh, from uh, this next generation of writers working here, someone who really knows everything and what, uh, knows a lot of people along the way. Also a curator for the Blue Metropolis Festival. So uh, you, can, you can look for David Bradford to be doing some pretty interesting things over the next couple of years. So those are the four books I would recommend if you're looking for some uh, new books from Montreal to read. That was awesome. That was so good. Thank you for that. Um, there's a lot of good questions here. I'm going to maybe combine a, a few of them uh, and just move around a little bit, but uh, just start off with, with two sort of craft related ones. Uh, one is about tense, what, what tense does for you, what present tense does, whether you usually write in present tense or in, in one tense or another. And then um, was any of the dialogue happening in Arabic in your head and then being translated onto the page? I think I used to work in past tense more often, and now I find myself more comfortable in the present tense and the immediacy of the present tense, uh, because I find it gets me that much closer to where the story needs to be right away. In present tense, if you're orbiting around what you should be writing about, you feel it that much sooner. Uh, you need to be right in the middle. So present tense usually gets me there. I, uh, it, it, it helps me locate where the story is uh, that much faster. So I, I tend to work in present tense now. Um, did I find that the dialogue appeared in my head in Arabic? Definitely those idiosyncratic moments uh, do, because there is, uh, especially when, when I'm in that code switch, it's switching environment, when I'm around my family and things like that, we'll, we'll, we'll be mixing Arabic and English. Uh, a fair bit, right? And the Arabic parts are always the most colorful and majestic parts. And the English parts are always the most <laughs> practical, pragmatic parts. So that's the kind of dynamic I had between the two languages. Uh, English was informative. Arabic was, let's take a leap off the diving board into the pool and see what happens. So for the, for the colorful aspects, yeah, the imagination still works in Arabic for those. There's a question here that I think is really interesting about the inclusion of the, the women in Chinatown and their, and their community um, and sort of uh, the French lessons with, with, with Mona. Um, the, the question is, you know, was there something in particular that you wanted to show by featuring this, this other group of, of uh, immigrants? 
who don't speak English or French when they when they first arrive in Quebec? Yeah, I mean, I think when I was writing that, I was it was one of those days where I had no idea that was going to happen in the book until I got to it. And then I realized when I got to it that it was actually going to be quite significant because you have for the first occasion in the story, Muna meeting another community that's parallel to her, but because of the way society is divided, seem to be operating in this different silo. And so they weren't supposed to meet and see that their stories were the same uh, and that they were being held down by the same discriminatory forces in society. And it's almost like they found their dignity together by realizing that they both shared this uh, story and it became this, this kind of moment of clarity uh, in the story that, you know, Muna wasn't alone. There were others out there. It was just that society wasn't really allowing her to cross paths with them. And then it, it, it spoke truth to me after that, the more I thought about it and figured out what I wanted to do with it. And that usually it's immigrant communities who help other immigrants uh, at the end of the day. And uh, if uh, there's this whole side of society that happens outside of the dominant mainstream that happens on the edges that no one pays attention to and really gets quite functional and operational and manages to do quite a lot as long as it doesn't affect what's going on in the mainstream. So it'll just be left off to the side to do its own thing uh, as long as it's not harming anyone. And that's what these, these women were up to. Uh, so they were allowed to keep operating uh, on their own as long as they didn't offend anyone along the way. And I, I felt that that was still quite true today. And I wanted to reflect that in the book. There's an interesting question here about um, the, this person is asking, uh, I wanted to ask you about the response you got as the book was being discussed on air. Uh, you wrote in a Facebook post, for some people reading Hotline was an uncomfortable experience. Uh, I'm wondering about that. What, what sort of response did you get? And did you find that the response was a little different once you got, you know, Canada Reads sort of airtime or like once the discussion became more, more broad? Well, I think, uh, as I was saying before, I kind of spent this like two decades kind of in my own lane with, uh, with, with audiences that were very positive towards my work and very aware of what I was doing. And so once you get to a level of Canada Reads, it opens it up to this readership who would have never accessed your work otherwise. And so these questions of what to do with language uh, on a page, what to do with these notions of discrimination, what to do with the politics of the book, that's not for everybody. Not everyone's ready to, to hear, uh, to have that discussion. And uh, quite frankly, a lot of people uh, live in parts of the country where this is a very abstract issue. Uh, and maybe they 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 are not confronted with this uh, with this uh, reality or this degree of multiculturalism to to the same degree. So there was, uh, I guess, a discomfort that I began to sense in terms of living in Muna's mindset and what that meant for people. And I was quite surprised that you know, people could live in uh, these uh, post-apocalyptic mindsets quite easily, but to live in the mindset of an immigrant woman was a, was a different experience altogether. Uh, so uh, I guess I saw that play out on, uh, on Canada Reads, and I think a few other people did as well, because there was a lot of comments uh, about it afterwards. And it was a situation uh, a, a kind of uh, a recognition of a kind of discrimination that I've noticed at many points throughout my life. It was familiar feeling, uh, but uh, this time it was very public and uh, it just kind of felt bad. So I, I just felt like I, I, I was gonna like hate myself if I didn't say something for, for once. So I made that little note. Uh, and uh, what came after that was just this flood of support from, uh, from all over the country uh, about that. And uh, that was very reaffirming. There's an interesting question here about, you know, uh, the person saying, obviously, you grew up in Montreal, but, but did you have to do any research on what, what the city was like in the 80s? Uh, I, I was fascinated by that question because I'm wondering if you were just 
put down from what your memory or if you said, no, I have to fortify this by going and making sure that my memory actually matches with what happened? This was the most fun part of the novel. After it was done and I wanted to really just fill out the Montreal section, this is the beauty of the internet. And especially there is uh, Instagram pages dedicated to Montreal in the 80s. I'm thinking of 514 visuals, Montreal then and now. All these different pages you can follow that are there to document these dead malls from the 80s and the architecture involved there, what happened on certain street corners 50 years ago as opposed to today. And it's really fascinating that we, we interact with history this way and that uh, it makes our job a lot easier as novelists to be able to go uh, search for information that any uh, you know amateur photographer or hobbyist who has an interest there can really just upload all their information and all of a sudden uh, you know we have access to it. So. That was really fun uh, to be able to go and find out, you know, what store was on what corner at, at that, uh, you know, in any given era. Um, I, I'll say that when we moved here in the 80s, uh, one of the most exciting things to my family was the underground city. Uh, it was uh, my, my, my family. I'm not going to, this is a generalization, but like most uh, Arab families are amazed by malls. Uh, for some reason, we uh, we drop us in a city. We need to find the best mall as quickly as possible. So this city was just one big mall underneath the city, uh, waiting to happen. So we spent a lot of time in the underground city at the time, and so I have very fond memories of you know the tile work, the escalators, uh, the, the 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 fauna uh, and the flora that was uh, down there, and just uh, all the all manner of shops, uh, depending on you know which part of the labyrinth you wanted to find yourself in. Um, so uh, part it was this, this fusion of this childhood nostalgia, uh, as well as going back to confirm these things through uh, through Instagram and all these different uh, uh, forums. Um, yeah, I, I think I, I I turn I turned seven years old. Whenever I'm I'm in the situation where you can go underground and then come out a different part of the city, it just I will never not be awestruck by that. Um, there's a question here about. Uh, the many hats that you wear, writer, editor, teacher, journalist, uh, which is your favorite and why? Oh, that's easy, writer. I think uh, I wouldn't do any of the other ones if it wasn't to support uh, my writing. Uh, if it wasn't for the writing, uh, the other ones wouldn't make much sense to me. I'd just go make a lot more money doing something else. Uh, so, but uh, writing is uh, what organizes everything else uh, in my life. I, I think what, what I like to communicate to students and to anyone else who will listen, basically, is that if you're going to become a writer in the long term, you have to find a way to organize your life around writing. Otherwise, it's going to be a very disappointing, torturous process of not having time to write or not being able to focus on things that you need to focus on. So, uh, quite early on, I began to find ways to like incrementally uh, scaffold my writing life. And a lot of those things ended up being writing based. Uh, as I progressed, it became more and more writing based. Um, so I love all those things that I do. I don't think I trade any of them in uh, that uh, that quickly, but none of them would make any sense if it wasn't for the books I was trying to write in the first place. Um, one final one. Uh... There's an article in the Walrus that said uh, how about Hotline and how it proves happy endings are still worth writing about. Did you mean to write a quote unquote happy ending story when you started yes, writing this book? Absolutely, uh, because anyone who's read my previous books will know that I've written some of the most dour endings ever. Uh, I am a king of negativity, uh, and to the point where. I mean, I threw the protagonist out of a plane at the end of my last book and just like had him give a monologue as he uh, hurtled towards the ground. So it wasn't going to get any more negative than that. Um, and so I, I, I kind of wanted to give myself the challenge of saying, you know, we, we've become a society that kind of distrusts happy endings. We, we, we were suspicious of where they come from. Um, why don't I give this a try? Is there some way to do a happy ending and make it feel earned? And, and that became a really interesting writing exercise because it was going against the current of where people uh, think a lot of these days. And I wondered if this story was small and contained enough that I could pull out a happy ending that was 
momentary in nature, but somehow had these universal applications. Everyone knows in the next five minutes, if the book had progressed, the ending might be completely different, but it's all about that, that moment shining a light on everything that came before uh, that, that really um, makes it a happy ending. And ultimately, I think that's what it, happiness is. It's these, these little moments that emerge that give us this uh, perspective on our lives. They never last forever, ever. They're just uh, really these ephemeral episodes that uh, kind of just uh, make everything crystallized in the right way for a, a couple of moments and then they're gone. Um, there are a lot of really good questions here, uh, but I we have come up to the five uh, five o'clock mark where I am in the Pacific. Um, Demetrius is a beautiful book, and I'm I, I it's I knew it would stick with me when I first read it. I didn't realize how much, um, and I'm still sort of thinking about it a lot of time. It's been a pleasure to speak with you. Thank you for doing this. Thank you all for listening. And thanks to both of you. Thank you for your oh my gosh, your honesty, your generosity everything that um, you both spoke of tonight. It was it was really riveting. Um, I hope everybody enjoyed hearing from Dimitri and Omar as much as, as I did. And um, if you know anybody who's missed this fascinating interview, it will be available on our YouTube channel um, in the upcoming days. And please join us um, on April 11th for our next book club in which um, Rachel Rose will interview Sheila Hetty on her long-listed novel, um, Pure Color. So if you subscribe to our mailing list, you will um, get a notification about that. If not, please head to our website for more information. And I wish you all a good night. Thanks. <laughs>